one. But just today it's Dr. Yulia Kolovu. I'm sorry if I said the last name wrong. And then she's available with book Anna Komnena and Alexia, which I'm holding up right here, which I'm going to discuss today. Who also wrote the famous Alexia by Anna Komnena, another book we are also going to discuss today. And um, as always, I begin with uh, how did you, what was your inspiration to write this book the, about Anna Komnena? Okay, so um, first of all, thank you, Ellen, for inviting me to, to have this chat today. Um, my inspiration came a bit uh, in a bit roundabout way, actually. So, of course, I knew Anna Komnini, as, as the Greek pronunciation of the name is. I knew her from, from school in Greece. I grew up in Greece and Greek history, including medieval Greek history, which is what most Europeans would recognize as Byzantine history. It was one of the subjects I was taught. So I knew of her. And of course, not only as a historical person, but as the main character in a poem by uh, Constantine Cavafy, who is one of the most famous Greek poets the world over. So the one who wrote Ithaca, if, if you've heard of that poem, it's quite famous. Anyway, so he wrote a poem about Anna. And in that poem, he represents her as this very power hungry, ambitious woman. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was the image I had and the image that every most everybody who has heard of Anna Komnini knows um, and has of her. But later, um, I came across a novel. That's why I say it's an, in a roundabout way. I came across a novel by Sir Walter Scott. This is his penultimate novel. The, um, um, he And it was actually published just a few months before he died. Um, and in that, that is his only novel that is set in what we know as Byzantium. So the novel is called Count Robert of Paris, mm -hmm. and the subtitle is A Novel of the Lower Empire. And by Lower Empire, he means the Byzantine Empire, which was known as, you know, the Lower Empire as opposed to mm -hmm. the Greater or the Upper uh, Lower mm -hmm. em uh, Empire, which is the Roman what most people would understand is the West, Western Roman Empire. And that was a fascinating novel because uh, Anna is a character in that novel. She's not the main character, but she's one of the, uh, of the, of, of the main characters, let's say. And um, she appears as a historian in, in that novel as well. But obviously um, the novel was, is not very well known. It wasn't a success, even though Sir Walter Scott was a hugely successful writer. By the time he wrote this, he had, um, he was in his decline, so to speak. And that novel was not read by many people. But as I read it, I thought, okay, so here is Anna, um, a, almost a comedic character you know, with a lot of caricature about how vain she was and mm. how ambitious she was and um, how she wanted to be the first and the best in everything, etc. So mm. I started thinking about, you know, um, that uh, historical character. And then as I was doing my PhD in um, the University of Glasgow, uh, I thought my PhD was in um, creative writing. Uh, I'm a writer of fiction, of historical fiction, uh, in my late, you know, my later life, uh, even though I was trained as a historian and um, I worked uh, as one for years. Uh, so I thought, what about a novel that would be set in the same period and would involve Anna somehow? And this was my, my inspiration. So a very long answer for a very short question. Mm. Um, of course, we don't, you mentioned that you, in the book that he wrote her as a in the poem, he wrote her as a power hungry woman. And I, and I want to quote Edward Gibbon here, that he also writes her kind of that she betray every page in the vanity of a female author. And he <laughs> has, she has also been mentioned as a power hungry in the translation by E.R. Sweeter. So has she simply been misunderstood in history as a female historian and a female, I'm sorry, and of course as female in general? Is that yes. the case? Well, the short answer is yes. She has been misunderstood. And uh, it's, not, um, it's not very you know, difficult to find out how this happened. Um, 
before I say anything about how she was misunderstood, uh, I would um, I would say that in history, as in other sciences, I guess, but in history it's it's quite common. Very often, when a source is read or misread or overread or overinterpreted, it happens that future historians do not actually go back to the source itself to read it but we'll take the word of the previous person who wrote about it and sometimes build a little on it and embroider a little on it. And I think this is the case with Anna Komnini or Anna Komnina. What happened is that um, there was a mystery about how, what happened on the day of her father's death and how um, the succession was arranged. So. On the face of it, it was a normal succession. So Emperor Alexios Komnenos died and his son, John, succeeded him on the throne. Which we are going to come back to later, of course. Yeah, we'll come to John, of course. So this is the fact, this is the, the, the fact of the story. However, historians his, um, of, of the time or a little later than, uh, than that um, mention some episodes that are that seem a bit weird in this in this context what is simpler than a son taking over from his father mm. it doesn't seem to have been very simple so what happened was according to two historians one who was a contemporary and wrote his history based on on witnesses and testimonies that were you know that lived at the time and of course is one one source but she doesn't mention anything extraordinary about the succession nothing at all she just says the emperor my brother and then uh, at the end she describes her father's death but nothing like that but there's another historian of the times john zonaras who was a judge as well and he was part of the administration of, uh, um, of Alexis and, and, uh, and later. He, he actually was younger, so he, he was quite young when all these things happened, but he was a contemporary, roughly, who mentioned some shenanigans happening at the time of, of uh, Alexius's death. He mentions that his son, John, went to the chamber where Alexius was lying very ill and uh, about to die, and he took a ring the ring, the seal, the ring with the seal, from his father's hand, or he was given it, but it's not very clear whether he took it or whether he was given it. Mm -hmm. And then he mentions that John was, um, he then, John rushed to, uh, to the church of St. Sophia mm -hmm. and um, told the Varangian guard who were, you know, supposed to, to guard the emperor and that, that the emperor was dead. So they, you know, he, he became uh, emperor in his place. But this didn't happen that simply. There was a bit of delay. Apparently, John was afraid that some relatives, it doesn't mention, the history of Zonaras doesn't mention which relatives, but says apparently they were afraid that um, some relatives might want to dispute his succession. She so, doesn't write very fondly of him in Alexia, so there wasn't much brotherly love there. No, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's not much bro brotherly love in the sense of there's not much effusion or my lovely brother or my wonderful mm. brother, but she, she does mention my brother John quite coolly, but one might, you know, there are ways to interpret this. She doesn't write anything pejorative about him. She doesn't disparage him in anything. She does seem to be a little put out that he wasn't present all the time in the death chamber, you know, when he was dying. Mm. But I mean, think about families and think about relatives and think about how an event like that would be interpreted by a sister, by an older sister. If your younger brother had been to see the father who was dying and then left, without waiting out mm. with all the other relatives until the father was was dead this is the only part where she's you know she seems not judgmental exactly but kind of cool with her brother but there is no other actual instance where she but mouths her brother and uh, she does mention something about this inane you know this silly administration but she doesn't refer to her brother she refers to her nephew, Manuel Komnenos, who was the emperor at the time she was writing. Mm. 
So she doesn't really actually disparage. So I'm curious to know where you thought that she was being disparaging to her brother. Mm. And I'm, I will guess here, I will attempt to guess that uh, what happened was um, you read it somewhere, mm. but not in the actual Alexia. Do you I remember actually, any instance? Actually, it was in, I think it's Believe in Sweeters, which is the what, translation ah. that I have, that where he writes about in the notes below that he writes. In the notes below. I think it was in the Sweeter that she isn't very fond of him, that he didn't, he considered that she wasn't very, it wasn't much no. of love there. She, that, that's actually, I believe this is not fair because she doesn't really disparage him anywhere. She does say that when the baby was born, it was a baby that had um, you know, dark skin and large eyes, mm. thoughtful eyes. That is not a disparagement. She implies that he was not very handsome and that is a generally accepted fact. They even called him the Moor because he was very dark skinned. Mm. And he, you know, in the looks department, he wasn't really a looker, but the Komnenos men were not really very handsome men. They, they seem to have been rather small in stature, but very assertive and charismatic as personalities, but not really beautiful or, yeah. or handsome, as opposed to Komnina women who had famous beauties. So she mentioned he's, you know, he's not good looking, but he seems clever. That's not mm. disparaging, is mm. it? I wouldn't say so. No, yeah. so... Again, again, going back to, you know, the, the rumor about misinterpreting and misunderstanding her. I think there has been a lot of embroidery on, on the actual mm. facts. There is um, another historian. So the only historian who, who, who mentions Anna as the conspirator and, and the person who was really, you know, she really hated her brother and she wanted to kill him is Nikitas Honiatis. But Nikitas Honiatis was writing almost a century after the events. So he was never a witness or he was never there or he didn't even meet anybody who would have been, you know, conceivably alive at the time. And, was and, and what he does is he, he says, it is said, they say, as in a rumor, mm. you know, as, as in it was rumored that, you know, um, Anna, you know, was the, this, this person who you know, who disparaged her, uh, who, who wanted to kill her brother and uh, disparaged her husband for not wanting to kill he, he, his brother-in-law. Mm. But this is all hearsay, basically. It, was, it would have never been accepted in the court of law, so to speak. Mm. And of course, historians jumped to that and took gossip as, as a source of, you know how it happens. Even today, we see that happening live. Somebody says something as a gossip, as a rumor, and then it is taken that this happened as it's written taken stone. Face value. Yeah, but it's, it wasn't like that. We don't have any any proof that Anna did that. We only know about relatives, and we have a very good candidate for that. Her other brother, there was a brother Isaac, who actually took John's part and then fought against John and then took his part again and then fought against him again. So you see, there are many candidates for that. When when there is a throne in 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 question. Of course, a lot of people would be very happy to, you know, to jump in and, and take over. But Anna doesn't really seem to be one of them. And her husband, even less. So her husband was a very, very faithful servant of the emperor, of Emperor John. And he actually served him and went to expeditions, military expeditions with him and everything. So the the facts don't really agree with this idea, mm. but you can easily see how it could, it could be that a woman who was assertive enough to write a history book, not poetry, not um, a, a, a work of morals, you know, or a, but a mm. history, an actual scientific history book, you can see how this woman could be taken to be assertive over her, you know, mm. over her station. And it's easy from there to leap into conclusions. And this is apparently what happened. We kind of jumped a little bit ahead there, but I want to start from the we very beginning. I kind of want to start at the beginning now. And she's quite proud of this, that she's one of the first Komnenois in her family that is born in the Porphyrogenitus, which is born in the Purple Room, which is quite famous where imperial daughters and sons are born. So tell, let's talk about the birth in the Porphyrogenitus room. At the Black okay, Mecca so 
Yes, the the room was actually called the Porphyra uh, or the Porphyry room because it was lined with porphyry stone, which is dark red. It has this uh, very solemn, dark purple red color. And of course, we all know that purple is the color of the emperor, of the, of the imperial um, family in, in Rome and Byzantium. So it would have been, you know, draped and uh, soft furnished with a lot of, of stuff in, in, in that purple color. Mm. So this was um, a special room in a small palace near, uh, in, in, near the complex, near the, uh, the large complex of, of the great palace in, in Constantinople, which was on the, on the side, uh, on the seaside, basically on the south, um, on the south uh, side of, of Constantinople. And that is where empresses were giving birth uh, traditionally. Uh, um, so if a, a child was born in that room, it meant that it was the son or daughter of two emperors, an emperor and an empress, because the, the Byzantine empress was an empress in her own right and she had a separate coronation as well. So it was, yes, it was a huge um, validation to be born there because not only were you an actual prince of the blood, so to speak, or princess mm -hmm. of the blood, uh, but it also served to, to show a continuation of the tradition from ancient Rome. And Anna herself writes, uh, dedicates about a paragraph to the description of this room and saying that this uh, was actually transported from Rome stone by stone and rebuilt in, in the new Rome, which is Constantinople, or it, as we know it is Istanbul now, but it was Constantinople at Anna's time, or New Rome or Byzantium. Mm. So it showed a long tradition and it was very important for Anna to make that point because her family actually, her father was a new emperor. He was, he was not, he didn't inherit the throne from his father. Wasn't his brother an, as well? There was and an uncle, there was an uncle who became uh, Isaac, Komnenos, his uncle, his his father John's father, um, um, brother. Sorry, uh, but uh, there was no succession. There was no normal or you know uninterrupted succession. He was a newly made man, Alexius, and thus he was much more eager to prove the you know how the legality the. The rightful, you know, to, the, the, he was the rightful emperor by having a daughter born in there, and Anna makes up much of it as well. But they were new; they were new to this. They were not an old. They were an old aristocratic family, not very old, not one of the oldest, uh, but um, they wanted to make sure that their right was sort of, you know, validated and and accepted, and that's why the. The Porphyry Room and the, um, the title of Porphyrogenita is so important to her. So, what was it like for her to grow up in in a palace, in a black and white palace? Okay, so yes, that's a, that's another thing. So, uh, the Great Palace um, of Constantinople because, she, because which, she doesn't stay very long there. She's no, betrothed to no. Constantine Dorcas family. No. No, the Great Palace, that's um, by the time the Comnenae come, uh, come into, into power, uh, the Great Palace is not really used as a residence any longer, very rarely. They use it for official, for some of the official functions, but mostly as a center for administration. Mm -hmm. the, the family, the Comnenos family, Alexios, and as his uncle Isaac before him, they preferred the Palace of Blacherne which is in the north side, so it's in the northwest, so completely the opposite, the other side mm. of um, Constantinople. Um, and that's not, um, there are many reasons for that. So uh, one of the reasons is that uh, the Comnenos the men loved hunting. They were avid hunters. So they wanted to be near the country, near the countryside. My father would have gotten along with them well. Okay, well. <laughs> Yes, and I know uh, some some people who would um, a lot of aristocrats in here in Britain as well mm. would you know would understand would relate to that. So he um, he moved his family there, but the, the, it was not just that. There was also the, the Palace of Blaherna was a smaller palace, much smaller, much more fitted 
for a family and his mother, Alexios's mother, the very, very formidable uh, Anna Dalassini or Anna Dalassina, mm. wanted to, to, to make it very clear that this new administration of which she was a huge part had nothing to do with all the debauchery and loose morals that were associated with the great palace because before uh, the Komnenos um, dynasty came into power, there had been a succession of emperor after emperor and there were some very you know, naughty events had happened in that palace. And because Anna Dalassini or Dalassina, um, Anna's grandmother was a very, very um, moral woman, a woman of very strict morals, she wanted to make it clear that this was going to be a different time. Mm. So they wanted to, you know, cut any association with the previous corrupt regimes yes. and, and uh, start something new. There's another reason as well that at the time of the, um, in the, in the late 11th, early 12th century, um, we see a turn to the private. So the big, play, big churches, for example, are mostly, I mean, still used, but emperors and aristocratic families prefer to worship in smaller places, much more intimate. And there's there's a lot of um, there are a lot a lot of uh, very interesting studies about how you know space use changes and there's this move towards family towards intimacy towards smaller and more intimate uh, venues and uh, I think the the move to that palace is also due partly to that. Komnenos was very much a family man. He had many children. They had nine children all in all. So it was co completely different from previous mm. uh, dynasties that had no heirs or very few, mm. you know, children. So, so let's just talk about her betrothal to Constantine Dukas. How did that happen? What kind of family okay. was this? Yeah, okay. So there's, um, of course... Because she's very fond of him, as you write in the lecture. She, she was, she was, yes. So when Anna was only a few days old, she was betrothed to, to this boy who was only a very young boy at the time. He must have been seven or eight years old at the time of, of, of Anna's birth. So here's what happened. When Alexis became an emperor, he was not really an emperor, a sole emperor. He was co-emperor with this boy because this boy, who was also another Porphyrogenitor, so he was born in, in the same room as Anna was born a few years later. He was the son of the previous emperor and empress. And uh, Alexios basically became emperor via a coup, mm -hmm. a coup d'etat. We, 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 we did dedicate an, an episode 23 and episode 2 on Alexios Komnenos, which you can find with Professor Anthony Cadelvis, which I highly recommend. Excellent. Yes, I, I would recommend that too, because uh, Professor Caldelis is uh, really, you know, has written a lot about that and uh, has given a very descriptive, very, you know, detailed description of how mm. it happened. So that betrothal was a way to make uh, Alexios's rule even more legitimate, because mm. it was, you know, the perfect solution. Anna would marry the the heir of the previous emperor she would become empress and would join the the komnenos dynasty to um the previous so to, to the previous regime so it would it, it would seem like a smooth continuation which it wasn't because it was a coup d'etat unfortunately uh, this well, fortunately I, I don't know unfortunate unfortunately for, for for some of the people involved anyway this marriage never took place. And we don't exactly know why that betrothal ended, but it's highly likely that it is, it has a lot to do with the birth of a male heir to Alexius. Mm. So it was unlikely that he would prefer somebody else. Didn't he Constantine that pass away in an accident as well? If I remember correctly. Not not at the time, not at the time of Anna's, not at the time of the end of the betrothal. The end of the betrothal, which seemed to have taken place when he was a, a, a an older teenager or a very young adult, and Anna was in her seventh year of life, um, probably happened because there was a conspiracy 
to which uh, his mother seemed to have assisted a conspiracy against Alexius. So this yeah. must have broken the deal, but it's highly unlikely that this marriage would take place anyway. Mm -hmm. And then he died. He, then he vanishes from history. We don't know. He probably died. We don't really know, but he vanishes, you know, completely out, uh, out of history. And the last time Anna mentions him in, his, in, in, in her history, uh, as, as a person in his name, you know, Constantine, my, mm. my ex um, fiance, uh, is in reference to that conspiracy. Mm. So it's probably, she doesn't mention him, you know, outright as one of the conspirators, mm. but they, and she actually goes out to say, out of her way to say that he was against it and he tried to stop it and, you know, he, he, he didn't like it, but uh, it's, it's probable that his mother was certainly involved, so. So she draws it back ended. to the... She goes back to the Black Lunar Palace, right? She goes back to the, yes, back to her family, because uh, we have to say here, in case um, your listeners don't know, uh, that the, the custom was that if you were betrothed, you went to live with your future husband's mm. family because your mother-in-law would uh, undertake your education because she would like to, you know, to make you aware of how things were done in her household and you had to forget about your own household. And this was a habit that continued in, in Greece for many centuries after that, in, even in lower, you know, lower born families, not necessarily in imperial families. So yeah, she, she lived with her mother-in-law would to be, she, she, she never became her actual mother-in-law, but she and loved have, her, yeah. she loved her. And she, we have, which brings us to the next subject, because as you know, she writes the fa eventually the famous Alexia, which we are also going to write come to eventually writing the history, but she, if, for women in that time, if she, it wasn't very, it was kind of frowned upon to read and study. So where does she get the interest of history and where she, does she lose? How, how does she start studying? She did, as you mentioned, she gets a private tutor and she has to study in secret when she is in the Black Unite Palace. So how does she, how does she do this? Okay, so um, the, the story here goes that, uh, and that story goes by her biographer and obituarist, the person who wrote um, for her, uh, uh, who wrote her, um, George Tornikis, who wrote her obituary after, after her death. He says that uh, her father and mother didn't really, you know, like her to, to be th that educated. She was very educated, and usually so for her time. Let's let's make it clear that women were not exempt from from learning, or at least from literacy in Byzantium. It was considered a good thing for a woman to be able to read her New Testament and her Psalms. Not the whole of the Bible, but at least these two books were quite common. You know, the the New Testament and uh, and uh, the Psalms of of, of of David, according to, to tradition. So there was nothing like, uh, in the Orthodox world, there was nothing like the prohibition of, of studying the Bible for yourself that caused so many problems in the Protestant, you know, um, the Catholic Protestant world. You, you, were, you had access to these books and they were written in your own language as well. So it was easy for, for somebody to read. So um, in principle, her parents would not be against her getting an education. What they would be against would be her absolute love and devotion to ancient Greek literature, because ancient Greek literature with all the myths about gods and their love affairs and you know quite immoral behavior mm. was considered quite risque for for girls of that um, age. Even you know the most solemn epics like the. The Iliad and the Odyssey, which Anna adored, she just loved Homer. Which, of, which of course, the Alexia is dedicated to. Exactly, uh, she her, the Alexia is a sort of homage to Homer, uh, as as the Iliad or the or, or the Odyssey. Mm. Um, so th even even those very solemn epics ha contain a lot of stories that would not be suitable for a, a young girl's ears, but apparently Anna was born that way. She was born you know, with a prodigious love for learning and ability as well. But also let's uh, say here that her mother, Irini Dukas or Dukena and her grandmother, Anna were very well-educated women as well. So she's not, you know, even though her uh, Tornikis, her uh, obituarist biographer says, 
she was this phoenix, you know, something that never existed before, like a rare bird. She wasn't that rare in the sense that there were very well-educated women around her. Her would-be mother-in-law, Maria of Antioch, she was another one as well. And it seems likely that may, her love for, for learning was kindled by Maria as well, who brought her tutors and you know, um, put everything in her disposal so Anna could, could study because she loved it. She was a natural. Mm. She was a prodigy in this sense. So, of course, before we go to her betrothal, another betrothal to Nature Forest Brennius, which would become her husband, we have, I feel like we should mention that she was almost betrothed to a Seljuk Sultan as well, but of course it never happened. So, was this common that Byzantine princesses would be betrothed to Seljuk Sultans, or was this just thought, thought, it, thought but it never happened? No, that was just a, an insolent proposal, so to speak. It was just a proposal that was, you know, um, rejected out of hand. There was never, there was never a possibility that Anna would marry a Seljuk prince. However, Alexios was a very canny diplomat, so to speak. So he, you know, he liked to, 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 to keep things open. But no, he would never. He he never accepted any any proposal like that. And. The, the way Anna writes about it in her in the Alexia shows that uh, there was probably a discussion or maybe that was a, a topic of, uh, around which, you know, the family must have laughed a few times mm -hmm. because she, you know, the way she, she speaks about it is quite, oh, you know, he offered, but it, it was never mm -hmm. going to happen. No, but no. she did. Um, her Obviously, her marriage was a very important, very, very important issue. Mm -hmm. and, no. and I'm sure... Th Sorry, yes, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that she doesn't speak very fondly of the subject either, either in, in the lecture. So she, it, she has kind of things that doesn't age quite well in, in the modern era. So if you read the lecture, please keep in mind that this was written to almost a thousand years ago now. So they, as the way she, she told us certain words like barbarians or... Oh, well, yes. Yeah, so she doesn't write very fondly. Of so not everything in the lecture has aged well, unfortunately. No, and, and and it's obviously older texts are very much like that, and they you know they bear the spirit of their times as well. But to be fair, for Anna, everyone is a barbarian who's mm. not a Greek, but that she's only using this bar term barbarian as the ancient Greeks would use it, and that means simply that somebody didn't speak Greek. Mm. We have to make this distinction here. For for Greeks, for ancient Greeks, and for Anna and her, you know, intellectual world, you were a barbarian only if you did not participate in the culture. But if you did participate in the culture, and you spoke Greek and you wrote in Greek, you were not a barbarian, regardless of where you were born or what color your skin was. We have to say that in this sense, this mm. didn't age so badly after all. And for her, everybody who doesn't speak Greek is a barbarian, including all the Western princes who came mm. as part of the First Crusade. Mm. So... We, we are going to talk about Crusades a little bit, of course, as well in this episode. And uh, because there is an event in the, uh, in the Alexia that I wanted to bring up and figure out to get to that, but now I want to talk about her what, to be husband. So how does Nick Forrest bring news? I'd probably say that name wrong. But how does no, he no, you, you actually said it very correctly. No, no, Nikiforos Briennius is correct. So uh, obviously, Anna's marriage could have been an issue of, of you know, very, very intense mm. uh, discussions at the home because it was every marriage was an alliance. Marriages were never done in in the sense of romantic love. It was a bonus if there was something like that, and it seems that in Anna's case, there was mm. there was genuine love and affection between husband and wife. As so has, her, has an, this kind of love for history and writing intellectually. They they shared a lot in common. Yes, they, they had a lot in common. They shared a love of, of, of letters, of writing, of reading and of history. So her husband was also a writer. He's a, he's a historian and everybody in any time would accept that his history was not as good as Anna's history. Are some of his writers today? Some of his work? So, uh, sorry, have, can you have some of his work as a writer? Oh yes, yes, it has it has, and uh, it has, and I understand that it's being translated at the moment. If it's not finished already, 
uh, and to be published in English. It has been translated in other languages. Um, it's called, his, his book is called Materials for History, which is a quite a postmodern title if you think about it. And he wasn't able to finish it while he was alive. So he, he collected his, um, his data, but, uh, and um, started putting it together, but he, he, he didn't go very far. So Anna started writing the Alexiad as um, a continuation of her husband's work. Mm we have to remember that she started writing at an old age. So it, it was kind of like Thucydides, he died before he did finish his work. Yes, it seems, yeah, it seems to be a hazard for historians. So mm. uh, Nikiforos Brienne is like, he said this died before he completed his work. So Anna took over and she said, I'm building up on what he wrote, mm. uh, but obviously her work is much more vivid and, and mm much better written than um, materials for history. Anyway, so who was Nikiforos Briennius? He was a very, very important person in his own right because he was probably the grandson, some say the son, but there's been a dispute about that. But um, in my view and in, in the view of many historians, he was probably the grandson of another Nikiforos Briennius who was one of the... Um, of the men who tried to get the throne from the the em, from um, the previous emperor, the first, the third, I believe. Yes, yes, Botaniatis. Yes, Nikiforos Botaniatis. So, Alexios, as a young general, was sent against Nikiforos Briennios, his future son-in-laws grandfather probably, or father, some say, probably grandfather. He was sent against him and um, he was sent against him to, to stop, to stop his, uh, his coup. And there is a story in which Alexios managed to beat Nikiforos Briennius and capture him. And then as the, the two of them were going back to Constantinople, he fell asleep, Alexios fell asleep and Nikiforos Briennius had a chance and was tempted to kill him and escape, but he did not. So th that's the that's the story. Th that's a story that Anna mentions in the Alexiad and probably heard it from her father himself, mm -hmm. or maybe from Nikiforos Briennius, who might have been alive at the time she was betrothed um, as a young girl to to her future husband. So she might have heard the story from him or from her husband or from her father. Um, but uh, everybody agrees that Nikiforos Briennios, the Briennios family was a very, very powerful family. And it was good for Alexius to try to, 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 to have alliances with all the powerful families in his time. So exactly in order to avoid the fate of Botaniatis, who, you know, very foolishly did not want to, to, to have any family attachments to anybody. That's why he married a foreign wife. And he actually said it. He said, I want to marry a foreign wife because I don't want all the relatives, you know, be, being in, you know, in, in my feet all day. And he paid for it because he didn't have allies at the time when, you know, his, um, his reign ended violently. So um, Alexios wanted to to have the, the, the best families and the strongest families in, on his side. And this is why he um, chose Nikiforos Briennios. He apparently, Briennios had a lot of other good qualities as well. Not only was he a scholar and intellectual, he, he must have been by all accounts, not only Anna's, but other historians, a very handsome man. They say that he was tall and handsome and very regal in his manner. But everybody thought that he should, he, you know, he should be emperor because he looked the part, which is a very interesting thing to say, because, you know, especially today, I think that aged quite well, uh, to use your own um, slogan, because you know how today a lot of people discuss, you know, the optics of, of uh, mm. presidents of the United States, for example, and how important it is to be tall and you know, and, and impressive and good looking or whatever. So he, he was very much like that, Nikiforos. So apparently he, he was a perfect man and she was, she, she, she was happy with him. 
And again, I do believe this comes from Sweden or Gibbon, perhaps, but was there a kind of a coup d'etat that she attempted? You kind of answered this already, but in the, wait, wait, just wait a minute, but there, because uh, and, and a kind I think it was Sweden or Gibbon, she was kind of resented to, and looked at him kind of a little bit coldish, her husband, for not standing down yeah, to her coup okay. d'etat. But that's, I think we probably already answered this, that she, is, she if this wasn't the case at all, but where does this come in the picture that she that she kind of yes. presented him as a coward in a sense? Okay, so this comes uh, from ideas about what a, a virile man should be like in the time, not at the time of of, uh, of the reign of the Comnenos dynasty, but at the end of it, when after Constantinople was taken violently over by the crusaders of the Fourth Crusade in 1204. So Nikitas Honiatis, the historian of that particularly tragic event, wanted to, to give an explanation of how this came about. How come, you know, the new Rome fell like that, you know, this ab abysmal way. And he tried to show that it was the fault of the women or the fault of the men who were allowed to be led by women. So there's this narrative, um, which is kind of like a, an introduction to his uh, proper history, which talks about the, the time of, of, um, of that uh, terrible, terrible disaster for, uh, for, Byzant for Byzantium. Um, and he, he says that the women ruled in the Komnenos family, which was a dynasty in, in, um, on the throne at the time of the, of the, of the Fourth Crusade, um, it, it, the Comnenus family were, were always led by their women. So he starts with Alexios. He starts with, no, he starts with Isaac, actually. Um, the, the uncle of Alexios and his wife uh, and how she was, uh, when, when Isaac decided to abdicate and you know, go away and, and be rid of, of all the, and go to a monastery and, and, and stop being an emperor because he just didn't want it. His wife, you know, admonished him and, and complained, and she was bitter and whining and whinging and all that. And then Alexios' wife, Irini, nagged him all the time in bed. Actually, Nikitas Koniatis has a scene where the two of them are in bed, and she's, you know, she's uh, <laughs> always nagging and saying, "Why don't don't make John our son the emperor? Make Nikiforos. He's he's the he's the real deal. He sh he should become emperor." Mm -hmm. And Alexis goes and tells woman, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm never going to do that because everybody will laugh at me. So he has this kind of fictionalized mm. episode. It's, it's impossible that Nikitas Koniatis would know that such an event took place. He makes it up. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So in the same spirit, in the same spirit, he has a scene, which again, as I mentioned before, is prefaced, prefaced or introduced by the phrase, it is said. Mm. So again, yeah. gossip, you know, gossip mm -hmm. dressed as uh, that when uh, Anna's conspiracy failed, and again, let me remind the listeners that Anna was not mentioned as the conspirator in any other history. She was never mentioned. And even Nikiforos Briennius was not mentioned as conspirator in Zonara's history, who was a contemporary. He just says that some relatives meant to put him on the throne, but it doesn't, nowhere does it say that he wanted, he accepted that, mm -hmm. that Nikiforos would accept the throne if they offered it to him. Anyway, so Nikitas goes on to say that when this, this coup failed, because Nikiforos being said, look, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I don't want to kill my brother-in-law. I'm not going to be emperor. I don't want to. So she was furious, according to the rumors and the gossip, or <laughs> probably Koniatis' vivid imagination. And she, she turned and said, no, that's not fair. Nature was wrong here. I should have been made the man and he should have been the woman. But so I'm this is kind of where she you get the she was a power hungry. Yeah, mother. and and, she, and and that she disparaged and despised her husband for being a coward, a weak coward. That is only gossip and rumor. It is it is not ascertained by any other sense. And even Nikitas Koniatis himself says this is said. One thing I have to mention here, she didn't mention these terms. I spoke very, very, I glossed over the actual words that Nikitas Koniatis uses. But what he says, actually, I don't know how, he, she, she mentions genitals and she says, I should have the male 
member and he should have the female member if you see what i mean yeah. so it is very explicitly very explicitly sexualized in the text and yeah. we can imagine that you know this is really um not what happened mm. and anna who's a very she comes across as a prude when she writes you know she's mm. very a, a very pr prude you know <laughs> very modest woman she would never use words like that but obviously the gossip of the palace is did malicious feel, did you feel like she, it was unfair that women can become you know we haven't had of course famous empresses before but before Anna, like theodora and zoe but i don't, I don't remember the exact date when they were ruling but you know did you feel like it was unfair that she was born a female and therefore couldn't become empress in a sense she doesn't mention anything like that conceivably anywhere in her history no one else says that the other historian who wrote about her at the time john zonaras he doesn't even mention her by name he says brianis's wife you know the daughter of alexius mm. who was a very educated highly educated woman and she spoke attic uh, she wrote in beautifully in the attic dialect these are the only things he says about her nothing else just praising her education and learning nothing else her biographer and obituarist George, George Tornikis doesn't mention anything like that. No, this is just in Nikitos Koniatis' imagination when he says that she, you know, she was. And then the historians, in, in future historians, took that and embroidered it. Strangely, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I would recommend everybody to, well, you can read my book, of course, but there's also another book by um, Professor Leonora Neville. Um, which is called Anna Komnini, The Life and Work of a Medieval Historian. It's a scholarly book, an academic book. And she, she very, very carefully and meticulously shows this genealogy of Anna's disparagement. And it's interesting that it started in the 18th century. The first translator uh, of, um, one of the first translators of the Alexia. Um, Butler. Not, not Buckler, that, that was in the 20th century. Mm. In the 16th century, mm. in, sorry, in the 17th century, 1680s, in the 1680s, the 17th century, one of the first translators of the Alexiad was uh, Dicange. Uh, uh, I think the full name was Michel Dufresne Dicange. Anyway, he was um, um, a French historian and aristocrat. So he, sp he speaks of Anna with high praise. You know, he praises her her work, her, his, his history, her learning, her language, everything. He doesn't mention anything about her being power hungry or jealous or envious or disparaging mm. her brother, nothing like that at all, okay? But there is an 18th century, so it's interesting that in the 18th century, this discussion begins, this disparagement of Anna, you know, of, of, um, of or the, the reading of her work as, you know, the, the disappointed a bitter work of a disappointed a bitter woman and uh, so that's another historian uh labo charles labo and then uh, gibbon takes over and he basically has a party with with that and you know and starts putting in his own judgments but, about but it but to, and be then, fair, to be fair he wasn't really friendly to Byzantium at all he didn't no. like the empire in general no and one of the and it's interesting that one of his major uh, major accusations of Byzantium is that it wasn't masculine enough mm. so you, you I mean you can see like, again, like, we, like we said before we don't take consideration that this was different written in the 18th century not not in today's era so it was in written in a different time so we got to take exactly. that in mind as well exactly and so for 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 him and for other for gibbon and for other historians of the 18th and 19th century byzantium was this effeminate time mm. so and for that reason they considered it outright bad you know the time of women and eunuchs you know mm. so they are very unkind to, towards Anna, and they uh, they read her um, her her work. So if you're biased against someone, and then you read the work, you're looking for clues where there are no clues. Mm. If you see what I mean. So yeah. prejudice kind of colors their understanding of, of it. But uh, no, nowhere nowhere does she does she say that she regrets being not being an empress. It was it would have been unheard of. I mean, why would she think she would become empress? There was no reason for that, you know, and, and we see from other 
other historians and other um, writers of the time in literature, for example. So the court poet, the, the court poet laureate um, of the times as well, Theodore Prodromos, we see that she was participating in events like marriages and baptisms and other you know, courtly events with her brother after the alleged coup took place. And he, you know, he gave away her son uh, in marriage and, and things like that. So would he have done that if his sister was, you know, had threatened to kill him? Mm. I don't think so. But that's the thing about Byzantine studies. A lot of the knowledge we have today was not known at the time. Mm. So, you know, historians read something, they read a disparaging comment somewhere else, and they put two and two together and make five or six rather than four, you know, and, and, mm. and run away with it. So, yes, I think, um, I think a, a new reading of these works and a much more careful reading of the sources as well is in order if anybody wants to be fair. Do not trust historians of the 18th century to tell you things as exactly they were. They, mm. you know, a lot of people mistake time with, with mm. truth and say, because this was written in the 18th century and it was nearer the time, you know, near the 12th century, that then it must be truer than something that is written in the 12, 20th or 21st century. That's not true. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm not scientific. I'm, I'm not saying this is kind of a fair comparison, but I, I had the Egyptologist in Dodson on a while ago, and we talked about this, and he said that the, especially when it comes to Egyptian history, a history book from two years ago to, would be irre irrelevant because it's so much new material coming up every every oh, year. Yes. So kind yes. of similar, same, not not just in centuries, but you know. The, That's the, an excellent most... point. Yes. So yeah, uh, this true. this this brings us to the next point, which is writing the Alexia and. Uh, and go to monastery as was common with the princesses that they would that they would go to monasteries when yes after the, uh, as widows yes and I, as, I, I just feel like when when you re read it the Alexia you can kind of picture Anna in the kind of little dark room writing the Alexia and the water dripping down the ceiling you can with a little water window. dripping down I don't no. know. I don't know. I don't no. know what it looks no, like. No. I don't know, but it's just you know, trying to picture that her in a room, writing the Alexia oh, was... with a little window. You know, kind of. Uh... It, was, it was not. No, it was nothing like that. Actually, it was quite the opposite. That place where she she went uh, as a widow, because widows would not. It was not sensible for widows to to hold. Didn't you know to have a, a household. A big household like that, mm. and her mother Irini, who was also a widow. Uh, she had made provisions for, for herself and for her daughters to withdraw in, not in the monastery per se, and this is very important to, to note, it wasn't the monastery per se, it was the area, it, so it was, imagine a very large estate, which is separated by a wall, and on one side of the wall there is a monastery, you know, with, with proper nuns and, and, and an abbess and everything, and on the other side, there's another complex of buildings, which are much more luxurious, much more comfortable. They're not, they're connected to a monastery by a door that locks on the other side. So the nuns cannot come in, but the empress and her daughters can go to the monastery side if they want. And that part of the, of the, you know, the, the wider, the broader monastery, uh, which is um, the, the monastery of Kecharitomeni, full of grace, translated, of the um, mother of God, full of grace. Um, and that part of the, uh, of the monastery would be accessible to men as well. So men visitors could come and visit the empress or her daughter who were living there with her children, if they wanted, the servants, they had servants. So do not imagine anything like a, mm. a small, narrow cell. Imagine a very comfortable, very luxurious set of apartments um, separated by a monastery where food, the food and drink that were served were completely different from the monasteries and where the women had freedom to move, to go or come as they pleased, although they wouldn't really, you know, because women obviously of, of, of higher 
uh, aristocracy would not be very eager to be seen outside, but it was not forbidden. And um, we're certain that Anna would have visited the Great Palace to find documents and things if she wanted, or she could have them brought over to her. And she certainly had witnesses, eyewitnesses, you know, her father's soldiers, mm. people who went to the First Crusade um, with, um, um, with the, the Byzantine army, and she got a lot of information from them. She, she says that herself. So the scene she describes in her history about writing, she says, I'm in this room and it's getting dark, so the lamps are starting to be, to, to be lit now, and I'm tired because I've been writing all day and my head is swimming. Um, you know, she, she gives a very vivid description of herself as, as a woman who's been writing all day, and now she's tired and now, you know, the lamps are lit. But please do not imagine a medieval mm. monos, you know, cell or anything like that. No, it was completely mm. the opposite. It was a life of luxury and ease. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, let's talk about writing the election itself for a little bit. Yes. It's important to remember that she wrote this in her old age. She was in her late forties after she was widowed. This must have happened when she was, um, possibly in around 1142 or 43. So she must have been in her late 40s, early 50s at the time. She was born in 1083. So yeah, 50s. So she um, she says that she, she started to write um, because she wanted to continue her husband's unfinished work. So she used his, his material, but then she conducted research on her own uh, right. And um, she explains how she did that. She read a lot of documents. Some of them she copies uh, in her work and, you know, like citations. And she spoke to a lot of eyewitnesses and people who, who knew about these events. And of course, she, she must have read books that were available at the time as well. She certainly had read Michael Pselos, who was the great, you know, historian, very, very popular historian um, in, in the centuries after that as well. His and her works are amongst the most published Byzantine, you know, works of, of, um, of literature, even today. They're in print today in English too. So, she she was a proper historian, yes, but she was an older woman. So she plays that game where she says, oh, you know, poor me, I'm a poor widow, what do I know? But then, you know, and then mm -hmm. on, and, and the next line after that, after saying, oh, I'm, what do I know? I'm just a poor widow. And then right after that, she said, so as I was saying, the general of that expedition, yeah. you know, <laughs> So that is a very, um, you know, that this is a very interesting change of, of, of tone. And of course, a lot of um, 18th and 19th century historians said, oh, she writes that because she's jealous and she's disappointed and she's bitter. But then a more careful reading. Uh, kind of by... more sense of humor or kind of. No, actually, there is a technique. There is a, a very, very old rhetorical technique, um, which is called captatio benevolentiae in Latin. It, it means she, when the writer is trying to capture the goodwill of the reader. So Anna, because she's a woman and she knows that the readers would be very suspicious of a woman writing history because history is not like writing poetry. To write history, you have to, to speak to witnesses, you have to you know, mix with men and discuss manly things like weapons and arms and ta mm. tactics and, and things like that. She does that. She does just, write, yeah. She, she does write to, a fascinating paragraph about the crossbow in Oh, in exactly, book. yeah. She loved technology. She had, she was very scientifically minded and she loved technology and she loved descriptions of, of military tactics and uh, ploys and weapons mm. and all that. No, she was, of course, men would, would say, men of a certain education, of a certain generation would say this is a, a masculine interest. But of course, we know that there are women who might very well be interested in, in the sciences as well. Mm. You know, it's not maybe more men 
habitually do this, but that doesn't mean there are no women whose, whose brain is more scientific or, you know, mm. more orientated towards technical things, mm. as, as we very well know today. Now, there is one chapter which kind of comes up as in Alexia, where she writes about Bohemian, I believe it's Bohemian, where he, oh, fake, Bohemian, yeah. where, where he writes fake, fake his own death, but this, according to Sweeter, and we go try to bring out him up again in the when we talk about translations of the Alexia, but he say, claims that there, there is no other sources that that writes about his him faking his death, but just in Anna Comellas, Alexia was this. Why why is this? Why is there no yes, other source? So that, is this made up? Yes, possibly, possibly. Uh, even though maybe others didn't know about it, you know, maybe it wasn't known, and uh, but maybe it, it could be made up. This is not something unusual in history, in, in ancient history or historians who write like the ancients. You know, a lot of times, and Nikitas Koniatis did this very famously himself when, you know, he had all these episodes with Alexius and, and his wife, you know, nagging and, and uh, you know, fighting in bed, you know. Um, a lot of historians do that, you know, they, they invent episodes that, kind of materialize an, an abstract idea. And it's possible that Anna made it up or maybe she was she had heard some kind of gossip about mm -hmm. um, the situation. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if more, as you know, sources, more sources come to the fore. I wouldn't be surprised if some source somewhere else mentioned that episode. It certainly, you know, gives a, gives a, um, an impression of Bohemond that he was this very wily man and very cunning, cunning like a fox. So, but yes, it could could well be an invention. But history, this is not something unheard of. It was not. It would not be considered as fraud in the ancient times. It would be considered as a ploy to to show to make your point better. And this is something people have to have in mind when they read history of a certain time that things that were acceptable then, you know, like literary tropes like this may not be acceptable today, but that doesn't mean they were deliberately fraudulent or malicious. That was not the intention of this. No, that's not the intention. The intention is to make a point. Mm. And of course, if you read how uh, the whole presentation of Bohemian and Bayana, she does make him this super villain, you know, the super mm. villain, almost a Marvel supervillain who lands on, I mean, there's this amazing description when he lands in Corfu on the island of Corfu and, you know, he shakes his, mm. his hand and says, Alexios, I'm coming to get you, you know, something like that, you know. Mm. This is really very, very narrative and it's very much into this sort of trope. It, it's doubtful that uh, Bohemond would have done that. We don't know, we couldn't know. Mm. But, you know, it fits with the narrative and it fits in with the presentation of, of Bohemond in a certain way. Which but to be the, fair, a, a lot yeah. of historians do that even now, right? Yeah. So, which, which brings us to the next topic, which is translation of the Alexa. And you mentioned the French one, but to the English one, which I want to focus on, there's been major, three major work, translation. The first one, I believe, by Georgina Buckler in 1929, and then Sweeter in the 60s. And lately, the latest one is, of course, by Professor. Uh, sorry, I don't have his name. Peter Frankopan. Peter, Peter Frankopan. Frank Frank yes. I'm, so, yeah. why, why, did, why did they need to trans so, okay. so many translate in your size, okay. many translations? Okay, so uh, a correction, first of all, if you if you allow me. So it yeah. wasn't Georgina Buckler who 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 did a translation. It was Elizabeth Dawes. Mm. Uh, Elizabeth Dawes, who was educated in Cambridge, in the University of Cambridge, she translated the Alexia in 20, 1928. And this is um, because this translation is in the public domain in the UK, at least. It's available for free on the internet. You know the Fordham database, Fordham University database has the whole text there for free. Um, Georgina Buckler wrote the first PhD thesis and the first study of the Alexia as her, as her PhD thesis uh, on Anacom uh, in the same year, it was published in the same year, and she used that translation 
Elizabeth Dawes's translation in in her work. So Suter um, did his translation in the sixties, and then Peter Frankopan had that translation in the early twenty. 2000s, 2008, I think mm. it came out. I can't remember exactly. But why so many translations? Okay, um, first of all, because this is a very popular work, mm. you know, for Byzantine uh, for, for Byzantine literature, which, 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 which is not very well known in the West, at least. Um, this is one of the most, um, you know, popular works because it's interesting, it's well written, it's very vivid. There are all these episodes, you know, micro episodes in there that really illuminate the characters and the times as well. Um, and of course, in the 1920s, the language would have been quite different from the 1960s. And then again, with times that change and with the awareness of Anna's, you know, how to read properly a text that was written in the 12th century by a woman, um, obviously all, all the translations, particularly with all the, you know, the prejudiced ways of, of viewing it are, are not suitable for the times any longer. And I'm sure that many more works will be retranslated as the times change. And ideas about um, people and, and, and writing and about what you write and how you write and what you do by writing what you intend to do by writing change so translations have to, to move with the times as well and of course i want to end with with what is what would you say is the importance of anna in history as a historical but not just as a historical person but as the first female historian the answer trying to speak for itself but just what would you say Yes, well, she is the first female historian in, in this genre of history anyway, because apparently there were or someone whose work has survived as a whole in the Western world, because I'm not, I'm not talking about, I, I believe there, there's a, a female historian in China before, before Anna's time, but uh, that's a different world about which I know nothing, so I would not um, presume to speak. Anna is very important because women need this genealogy of intellectual women you know many times maybe not maybe that's not how people uh, see it now because there's a lot of talk open talk and plenty of talk about mm -hmm. feminism and women women and empowerment of women etc mm -hmm. this education for women but this was not the case until very recently as we all very well know and even in our enlightened times you see how much prejudice is there there is against you know very educated women so um, it is very important to know that Anna and people like Anna, women like Anna existed, you know, and could write whole proper researched and interesting and well-written histories. And um, that it is also, Anna is particularly interesting uh, as well because of all the story of her reception so you see what happened to her. She wrote a history book. She wrote an important history and see what happened to her and how she was disparaged as a power hungry woman, as a conspirator, a would be murderers of her brother, you know, the worst of the worst of the worst. And because she failed in something she didn't even try to do apparently, you know, she became this monstrous woman. It's very important mm. to have Anna as, a, as an example of, you know, the prejudices of history and how Things can change if, mm. uh, with time and with more careful research. I would also like to say that, and this has been noted before, that this is the only kind of, kind of only source on the first crusade from Byzantine point of view, isn't it? This is one of the yes, it is. It is the only the only actual uh, extensive source because there's a mention of the first crusade in in Zonaras's, uh, history, and there's ob obviously a very uh, a light, a, a very uh, small mention in other works, but uh, the Alexia no. is the one source that very, very, you know, extensively writes about the First Crusade, but only up to a point. She she writes very in in great detail from the Greek point of view, or the Byzantine or the Eastern Roman point of view, whatever you want to call it. And, and it's until, not worth noting that she's called European Celts, not not European. Yeah, she calls she calls the Westerners Celts. 
yes, she calls them Celts. Uh, and Franks, but obviously they were not just Celts or just Franks, there were a lot of, of different people there. She she has a lot of, yes, there, there is a, <laughs> okay. Uh, Anna has been considered prejudiced because she writes disparagingly about the Western princes and, um, and leaders of, of the crusade. But people who say that should read how Western chronicles write about the Byzantines in order to, to gain a perspective of what prejudice means, because they, on their side, can also be extremely prejudiced against the, mm. uh, against Alexius. I, I had done a study uh, for a paper in um, a few years ago, and um, I collected the words used by Western chroniclers of the First Crusade, and you know the amount of words like devious, lying, cheating, two-faced um and of course they eat the food with forks and knives <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh how dare they but of course that's an that's an older story mm -hmm. but yes mm -hmm. they were always viewed suspicious uh, with good suspicion and um even though alexios did try to help them as much as he could and he did try to hinder them as well because imagine you know thousands and thousands of people landing mm -hmm. in your in your in your territory and you know not the nicest of people not the politest of people you know rampaging and and killing and and, and raping you know you wouldn't like that would you no <laughs> anybody would have done you know anybody would have done much more than alexius did mm. so yes but uh, it, it is an interesting point of view as well and i think no study of the first crusade would be complete without taking that point of view um as well and uh, of course i uh, I was going to say as well that in the episode with the disjustice briefly with Peter, Professor Peter Wilson in the Holy Roman Empire episode that we, that in the Holy Roman Empires, they call them leader of the Greeks and the Byzantines call them leader of the Germans and vice versa, you know. So exactly, very... yes. Exactly. It's not a one-sided, it's not one-sided from one side only, so to speak, mm. you know, both sides do the same thing. They... They promote their own side and disparage the other. That's that's not unusual. Mm. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And before you go, do you have anything you wish to promote? Any social media where you, you might want to share or any links you wanted to put in the description below? Uh, well, I, I do have a, a Twitter account, but uh, I well, if, if you would if you would like to write, to read my book, um, you can find it in all good bookshops and you can find it in, in pen and sword who, who are the publishers um which i highly to recommend it. to do by the way if you would if you want uh, to re read alexia do i would highly recommend reading her book before going into the alexia well it's it's it, i think it's it's fun even though i say so myself hmm. thank you so much thank for you very much uh, before Thank you, you very go, much I'm for having to, me. No worries. And I also would like to add that we actually had a donation to the podcast, which is thank you very much to whoever donated. It's most appreciated. And uh, my name is Alan. This has been with that as well. We are available on Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you can find podcasts. You can find us on Instagram and with that as well. Make sure to follow us for updates on the latest and the next episode. My name is Alan. This has been the Data Age as well. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you like this episode, make sure to check out some of the other episodes as well. I think you're going to find them highly enjoyable. And if you like this podcast, please consider writing a review. It would help us massively. My name is Alan, and I'll see you next time.